Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm really good. Thanks. Thank you so much for attending and for um, being a panelist and an expert on this webinar, part of our, our series of webinars that we do in order to provide more information to salons and some guidance and some leadership through VISH um, and through your usage and experience with VISH. Uh, we're going to touch on quite a few topics today, um, but I would love to begin just by having you introduce yourself, you know, talk about you know, your years in the industry, if you want, uh, your salons and uh, just general sort of experience, if you could. I don't know if we start talking years in the industry, we start aging ourselves, right? <laughs> uh, my name's Laura Wagner. I um, own co-own Celebrity Spa and Salon in College Station, Texas with my sister. Um, I have been doing hair for 20 years, and my sister is actually an accountant, so it kind of works out great. We've got the best of both worlds. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about us. I am no longer behind the chair. About uh, 2015, I quit doing hair just to manage our salon company because we have about 50 plus employees. So um, that's a little bit about us. So yeah. How many, sorry, how many years have it been since you've been behind the chair? Um, I... Stopped doing hair in 2015, 2014, 2015, beginning of 2015. Yeah. So, and I know it's a burning question for salon owners who want to get there. How long did it take you to transition out from like, I made a decision that I'm by, you know, that I'm going to stop cutting hair. How long did it take you to get to that goal? Uh, so I started doing hair in 2002. I, my sister and I started the salon company in 2006. Um, I transitioned out in 2015. I, I kind of wanted to stay part time behind the chair like I was, but unfortunately, um, I have had numerous shoulder surgeries and wow. I was having my last or fourth child. And so, um, I just decided it was probably about time to hang up my hat. So it was, it was a hard transition because it was a forced transition, but hindsight, um, I feel as though I can run the company a little bit better and grow how we have been without me being behind the chair. So, yeah, I mean, having an injury is never a great way to be forced out, but I, I came to my mind right away. I used to work with um, a gentleman by the name of Scott Buchanan, who owns Scott J salons in New York. And he was just not getting ahead, just really kind of digging and being a hairdresser every day and not working on his business. And uh, he was cutting down a tree and it fell on him. And oh. so he went from like behind the chair to not behind the not chair mm -hmm. one, in one accident. And he said, besides the injury, it was the best thing that ever happened to him and his businesses. So, yes. uh, all right, well, I appreciate you sharing that with me. I wanted to... Uh, Briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tim Howard, and I am one of the founders, a kind of creator of Vish um, many years ago. My background comes from being in the industry as a hairdresser, salon owner, and also uh, I worked for a product company, being an educator for them uh, for many years, traveling around mostly North America, but all around the world doing hair. Um, and I just knew, you know, managing my salon, especially the color side of the business was a challenge and it was an area that I was losing money or not nearly as profitable as I should be. Um, so, and then time in the industry, visiting salons, it just resonated. I mean, everybody was having that as the number one problem is control of the color bar. So that's how Vish was born um, in that, you know, we knew that there was a way to solve the problem and it really started off with solving the waste. But as we're going to get into today's webinar is there's so much more to Vish. There's so much more that it does. And really waste is just one part of the problem. Um, you know, once that's eliminated quite simply through reweighing your bowls, we really look at everything else. So how you're pricing your services, how if your services are even profitable, the fluctuation in that, how much your team are using. So all this data being so valuable um, that we're able to sort of address many issues that are happening in the salon. The topic for today's webinar, though, is profit and cost escalation. So we're taking a look at everything and all things that are salon about profits, price increases, pricing models, um, and just, you know, gaining as much insight we can there. I mean, as we know, there's been you know, massive inflation. We're seeing prices and, and costs skyrocketing. Um, but we know that us in the salons were slow to react. We don't always and price adjust our services 
to match what's going on in the industry or in the world, in the economy. Um, you know, often we'll absorb a price increase from a hair color manufacturer and we won't change our prices. So we're going to kind of really get into that as a general topic. Um, but of course, deviate many times to touch on some other things that, that are related to this topic as well. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions and by all means, elaborate as much as you feel. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we're going to pick your brain as much as we can. So how has your salon historically navigated price increases within the industry? So is it, you know, yearly, semi-annually? Do you raise them across the board or take a more strategic approach and just target specific services? So how has that worked? When we started in 2006, it took us a while to feel comfortable doing any form of price adjustments. Um, and my sister and I have a background. Our father has owned car dealerships for years. And so he was constantly, you know, they, they break it down parts and labor. And so he was constantly telling us we need to increase, increase. Um, but way back in the day, you know, it was uncommon to raise prices and why do you, how do you justify raising your prices? And then we started Summit. And so then we became a level salon. So price increases came from you earned a promotion because of the demand of your time. And then we really realized when we started breaking it down and doing our P&Ls, we've inflation, like you said, we've got to start increasing our prices, whether it be quarterly, annually, whatever it was. So we started doing annually when we got around to it <laughs> um, up until probably 2000 and. 12, 13, 14, we started doing it annually. Um, and it was January, probably the worst time to increase prices, but that's what we did. Um, and we just did it flat across the board. This is what we're going to do. Um, obviously, we started realizing the impact because your vendors are quarterly increasing, but we're only increasing once a year. So um, the pushback that we had from our clients or we thought we were having from our clients is was the hesitation and therefore we did it once a year, unless the service providers earned a promotion according to their levels. So, so okay, so if the service providers, then you move the service provider up a level, but you don't necessarily increase the price of that level, correct? Their prices increase as well as their commission increases. So the salon company really doesn't no. see an increase, right? But our service providers are getting an increase, yes. Right. So if I move from level one to a level two, the price of the level one, level two uh, balayage, as an example, doesn't change. The hairdresser just gets that bump and the clients pay based on the hairdresser. OK, that makes sense. Well, actually, uh, we do change their price. Their price does increase, but so does their commission. So it levels the same for the salon because we're I mean, the salon doesn't raise the price yes. of the service. Right. Unless you do it annually. So if we if we looked at that annually. How do you determine it? How do you determine, okay, it's January, we're going to raise our prices. Is it across the board you raise all service prices? Or is it just specific services, maybe leave the haircutting department out? How do you, how do you approach it? No, we did a, a complete across the board. What are we going to do this year? What was inflation? Are we going to do a 3%, 4%, 5%? What are we going to do that we feel our customers are going to be okay with? Um, so that was typically how we did, did our price increases. Right. Okay. And yeah. you, you had a set number in mind. And do, does that number adjust every year as a, as a, as a percentage? How does that work? So we've kind of reevaluated all of it, which I'm sure we're going to get into later when we talk about dividing it out. Um, it was, it was according to what inflation was, how our cost of goods went up that year, um, it, it, it was somewhat of a methodical increase, I would say, every year, um, but it was definitely just flat across the board. This is what we're going to increase our prices, 4%, 5%, whatever it may be. Okay. Okay, great. That's really helpful. Okay, so let's let's kind of go back in history a little bit. What was your pricing structure like before Vish? So what were the biggest challenges and drawbacks to the pricing structure? So I guess, I guess we sort of have to kind of give everyone a bit of a uh, talk about what your current is, which is parts and labor, correct? Right. So we have 
now currently switched, we have a service cost if you come in and you also have a cost of goods, um, parts and labor, so to speak. Um, I'm trying to think of a fancier way to say parts and labor, but. <laughs> you pay for the service as a set rate plus whatever product is used with the markup. Correct, yes. So that's what we are currently, or what we have switched over to doing, yes. Okay. And let's talk about that a little bit. So what were you doing before you were doing, you had product included in the service, correct? Right. So product was included in the service. Uh, let's just say you came in for a four ounce foil. You're going to get charged that. Um, if you do use extra product more than four ounces, they're just going to charge you a flat rate product charge, whether it be one ounce, two ounce, three ounce more, um, you're going to get charged. But that was also um, combined with the service charge and what the service provider was receiving. So they were receiving commission on that as well. Super. So if they used four or six ounces worth of color, the hairdressers paid for the extra product they use, even if it didn't take any extra time? So time was considered in that a product charge so if you let's say we allot 45 minutes for to do a four ounce foil to foil a four ounce foil um, and you have four ounces and it took you an hour to foil and you use six ounces you are charging the four ounce foil and you are just charging the chemical add-on so to speak because you used six ounces and that would be the flat rate that you spoke of and they would get commission on that flat rate right Okay. And how are you tracking this? Like, how did you know that your team were doing it consistently and, and were they doing it consistently? Making the, you know. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say we oh. were tracking it. Um, we just took the word of the service provider that you use six ounces of, of, of color or lightener or whatever you used. So, yeah. That sounds really bad. <laughs> what happens across the industry? And, you know, often when I interact with the salon, uh, and again, you know, just sort of backstory of this, like when we onboard a salon, we don't necessarily change our pricing structure right away. We're, we're in a sort of discovery mode in the beginning where we collect the data, just get them to use Vish, don't change your systems. The only thing we're changing is that you're mixing color, interacting with an iPad. Um, but then we can collect all the data and really look at what's happening. And a lot of times the salons will say, no, we're good. We're not going to do your product charges. We're going to keep our system because we're charging it consistently. And uh, I can think of two or three examples out of hundreds, thousands, where it, it they were doing it correctly. So in every other time it would be i you know it's not collected it's a fraction of what was actually should have been charged it's consistently this person doing it this person not doing it um which has so many impacts it's not only is it impacting the salon and the profitability but it's i think it's a really negative experience for the customer yes because they don't know if they're going to pay from visit to visit mm -hmm. so you feel that that was that was similar to what was going on in your salon i would say so Absolutely. I mean, you've got junior level stylists who don't want to communicate, oh, it's going to take more time or I'm going to need more products and just, you know, uncomfortable in those conversations and or they're budgeting their clients money because, you know, they're a junior level. So they're not, you know, going out spending all kinds of crazy money. So yeah, absolutely. It's definitely the case. And then, yeah, I mean, so, so let's look at um, before Vish again. And even like when you open the salon, how did you decide? And again, you know, and I'm, I'm not, I'm a hairdresser, not an accountant by any stretch. Um, and I wish I had a, had an accountant partner with me because I know so we should have had her here with us today. <laughs> been a lot more profitable early on had I have in my salons, had I have, you know, been more diligent with looking at my numbers and spreadsheets and forecasting and, and all that. But um, when you started the salon, how did you arrive at the pricing structure or the prices that you charged? So when you're setting up your service menu, what did you draw from in order to determine my half head foil is this, my balayage is that, my root color is this? What, what were the determining factors in, in coming up with those prices? Well, when we actually started the salon, it was kind of what I was 
previously doing. And that was just locally what our community kind of was doing. Um, in 2008, we took on Summit Salon Consulting Firm. Um, we had Michaela Baskerville. She is still our consultant to this day. So um, obviously she's done great things for us. And she kind of came in and told us about the level system and how to charge. And um, we actually did a demographic study, or excuse me, we, they did a demographic study. And I said, you know, we want to be mid to high end, but we want to be able to cover everybody within our community. And so they looked at, you know, what is the average income, what's high end, what's low end, and then let's create this level chart. So that's, that is currently or previous to doing our um, parts and labor. Um, that's how we were charging. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that I mean, that's, that's way more than I've heard any other salon over a salon owner um, describe it. Usually it's just, we call a few salons in the neighborhood, find out what they're charging, decide if we want to be higher or lower. Um, and then in determining that, so when you started did you start as an independent? You left another salon and your prices were similar to not shock your clients, your existing clientele, so that they would move with you? And did you start with other hairdressers? I did. So I uh, moved back to Bryan College Station. Um, I went to school up in Dallas at Tony and Guy. I moved back down. I went into uh, a booth rental salon with some gals I went to high school with. I just didn't know what else to do. And so I worked with them for a few years. And then I got a phone call um, saying, hey, there's this salon. There's two sisters actually that owned it. Neither one of them did hair. They thought it'd be a fun hobby. I realized <laughs> it's not just a hobby. <laughs> Owning a salon is not for the weary. Uh, so that's kind of how it happened. I called my sister and I said, hey, you want to work from home part-time and do some book work? <laughs> and um, so that's how we both kind of came about owning this salon. And then once we got into it, we realized, you know, I am not meant to do inventory. I tried doing inventory. She tried managing the spa and we realized I'll manage you do inventory and we'll go from there. And then once we kind of got rocking and rolling, that's when we realized, hey, we really need help in this industry. So that's when we hired Summit. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then how has that affected your profitability compared to pre- Okay, so let's look at the three stages. Let, and I know it's early on with Vish, but pre-Summit, um, with Summit, and then now with Vish. How has your profitability changed over those three major um, um, events or changes to your business? Oh, well, that's huge. So pre-Summit, I mean, we were doing maybe 17000 a month and I was probably at total service, um, service and retail sales. And I probably was doing 80% of that. <laughs> and then um, we took on Summit and increased 200%, I think the first year. Um, so this year we're on track for sales. Profitability. Profitability, uh, significantly with Summit. Oh, sorry. Uh, significantly with Summit. And we started tracking with Vish. What was it? We did October, we started, and then November, we started charging, but really we've only had a month and a half of true statistics. And I would say that's been a significant increase um, dollar amount wise. I would say, I think we are, we have increased 12 to 14 just last month wow. with with Which fish. In one, in one month yeah for sure that's incredible yeah and then um let's just how did okay so some of these things you know and i know just speaking to other salon owners and having these topics before changing so dramatically from including product in your service and sometimes charging extra product when this when the team used an extra two ounces Versus now we've gone to parks and labor where service is one thing, product is another with a markup. How do you introduce that to your staff first? So how do you get them on board? Um, because we know hairdressers at times can be a little resistant to change. <laughs> um, and then the second part would be, how do you talk to your, uh, your clients, your guests about that? So staff, uh, we've been really blessed. We have 
phenomenal people. We have uh, individually meeting, individual meetings with everybody every month. And then we've got quarterly meetings. Um, just communication, communication is key and transparency. Um, just the whole way through transparency with them. Um, yes, change is hard, but we try to be really methodical. We try to give them the verbiage. We try to line it out and show them the why behind it. I know, you know, a lot of people just say, kind of like parents, because I said so, do this because I said so, but they need to know the why and the why behind it. So there's been a huge increase in cost of goods. You all are aware of that, but we haven't had that. So we have to increase. This is what we're going to have to do. Um, and they were very receptive to it, honestly. Um, I do think same thing with our consumers, the time, the day and age. If we had maybe tried this pre-COVID, changing over to parts and labor, we've, we've talked about doing this for years and for a very long time. We were just, when's the right time? I'm scared to pull the trigger. And um, after COVID and everybody's just general awareness, the public's general awareness of cost of goods and what it takes, um, it's, it's very different now. And so I think that just us being very open and honest and communicating with our clients and having a very good script for our service providers to tell our clients, um, they have been very receptive to, I mean, nobody goes to the grocery store and yells at the grocery store manager because milk went up. Nobody yells at the gas station attendant. Um, and I feel post COVID, honestly, I hate to say COVID or whatever, it may be really helped us, but it, it did in this situation because Clients have really had no issues with it. Yeah, it brought awareness. Yes. Right? Yeah. Everybody felt it everywhere. And in fact, what are the stats on that? I know we have it here somewhere. So uh, prices have leaped 9.1% according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but not in the beauty industry. And a recent report by business specialist Klein found haircut charges just went up by 2.5%. So 9% increase. We, you know, and haircuts only go up by two and a half percent. And I think that's quite common in our industry. Um, and as a hairdresser, I'm sure you can attest to that. It's It, it always comes back to that personal relationship yep. and being afraid to tell the person that there's an extra charge because maybe you just, I don't know, you have a relationship with them. You know, they're on a budget or, you know, we also, it's hard putting value to our work. Um and doing the same work and then charging 15% more. So I do sympathize with hairdressers. And I think that is a lot of the problem that, that we have in this industry is there's a lot of sympathy where it doesn't always need to be because like you said, people are feeling it everywhere. So the price increase is something normal to them. So did you have, if you, if you were to gauge the pushback, was it more from your staff or, or like a reaction to it? Is it a harder digest for the clients or a harder digest for the staff? When you, you know, I had crazy anxiety about doing this the whole time we started talking about it. And when I said, okay, we're pulling the trigger, let's go. And I really haven't had pushback from either, which is pretty shocking to say. And I genuinely think that it's because of the time right now, because the last increase we did, um, we actually put off increasing prices. Um, post COVID, even though we shouldn't have, because as you knew, everything skyrocketed um, because the prior increase we had, we had such pushback from our clients and from our staff wanting to have that conversation. And so I just think the training that we did to be able to have our staff communicate to the clients. And of course the awareness that was going on, we really have not had any pushback from anybody. I mean, I could maybe count three or four clients who've been a little bit upset. And that's that's about it from, you know, seeing 3,000 clients a month. That's a pretty good number, I would say. <laughs> and I imagine no matter what you did, the same, like if you didn't go parts and labor, that you just said, hey, it's $5 more this year for a haircut, you'd get the same pushback, right? You're always going to get people who challenge the value or, or have an issue with price increases. So before you launched parts and labor, how far in advance did you prep your clients for that? Did you let them know that the next time you come in, you're going to see a change in your price increase? Can you talk about that a little bit? Like how, how what pre-work you did to notify your clients? We did pre-work on the back end with our employees and our service providers. We did not tell our current clients until they came in the door. And the okay. reason is, is I feel it's really important that you have a 
you have a connection with your clients. Um, as, as a salon company, we have a 70% pre-book rate. So most of our clients that are coming in have been with us a very long time and they're constantly seeing the same people. And I think that face-to-face -face communication and let me look at you in the eye and let me tell you about what we're going to be doing and the reason why behind it. Um, and then to be able to have that conversation of, okay, well, I'm not, that's out of my budget or what, not what I was looking for. Okay, well, let's either A, adjust what we're going to do today, or I can even put you with a lower level or a junior level stylist who's going to charge a lesser rate. So it's not going to impact you so that you can stay at your same price point and still receive great services. So we don't do it ahead of time. You know, we've had a few clients who would say, I wish you had emailed me or texted me or called me, but um, I think that that face-to-face -face communication is the best. Yeah. That, that, that's really smart. Um, okay. So in terms of, uh, let me just kind of reword this a little bit. Let, let's talk about the data. Okay. So you, we, so when we started with you, we started collecting data. We started looking at the services that you did. Um, what insights did you gain from that? And just for those of you who are watching who don't know, part of what we do, which I think is, if not the most viable, one of the most viable things that we do is regular data reviews. So we sit down with you via Zoom usually, um, and we kind of go over the last 30 days or last 75 days worth of data and really kind of build a story around what the opportunities are so that we can improve not just your waste, but all aspects, whether it's pricing, profitability, all of it. We, you know, we, can, we have a good look at that for your color business. So at what point did you decide, you know what, we're going to go to Parks and Labor? When, when did that become a decision for you? I remember, um, I believe it was Shelly who was speaking to you, one of the, our reps here at Fish. Um, and then one of your goals was not to increase, you had a percentage in mind. You didn't want to go over this percentage. So can you kind of talk us through and walk us through the realization of going to parks and labor, what led up to it and how the data played a role? So we knew we wanted to do parts and labor. Honestly, with my business partner and I, this went back a year or more. We've been wanting to get to Vish and start measuring and do this and transfer of it. It was just when is the right time. So we decided to go ahead and bring Vish on and start getting our staff accustomed to measuring their color um, and seeing it from that perspective before we pulled the trigger and sent it to the front desk to switch over um, parts and labor. I'm sorry, ask me that question. The last, which, the last thing that you said one more time. There's lots of questions in there and it made me forget yeah, my thoughts. <laughs> My, my brain starts spinning rapidly when I do these um, webinars. But what I'm curious about is, I guess, the strategy around it. How did the data that we provided or we worked with you and is available in your Vish dashboard, how did that data help you arrive at your decision? Or, and from what I've gathered from the first part of your answer, maybe going parts and labor is what led you to Vish? Is it just if you can clarify that. Yes, that is what led us to Vish because we've been talking about doing it for a very, very long time. We hopped on board. Um, shout out to Shelly. She's phenomenal. I'm just going to say that right now. Um, <laughs> I love talking with her. Anyway, um, so the whole percentage that you asked me earlier is we knew it was time for price increase. We had not price increased pre-COVID. Um, so we our percentage that we were talking about, that we kept talking about with Shelly, was 13 to 15%. Um, due to inflation from the last two years, cost of goods, all of those things. Um, we wanted to make sure our service providers were taken care of. So we wanted to increase service prices by 8%. So for the consumer that left us with about 5% that we wanted to play with to charge in product charges. So that's that's the percentage and the numbers that we came up with. Because honestly, if you come in for service and I'm going to charge you 20% more than I charged you six weeks ago, I feel like at that point, the consumer is going to say, oh, hey, wait a minute, you know, and then we were going to have an issue. You stick around that 13%. Okay. I think they're going to understand that we haven't increased prices in two years. The world is going to be fine. So that's where that percentage came with as far as how much are we going to be charging in our product cost right now? 
So again, how did you arrive at the 13%? What was what were you looking at? You're looking at inflation. What else were you looking at? Just overall? inflation and our previous increase and honestly just PLs, what how much has cost of goods gone up? Uh, it was a whole conglomeration of things that we sat down with our consultant and said, hey, let's 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 figure this out. It's time to make the plunge. How are we gonna do this? Right. And in previous years before fish before maybe even before a summit did you have a percentage that you would use to go up every year or was it just sort of a flat i'm going to charge an extra five or ten dollars for the service like did you um, take information in to outcome the the 13 to 15 percent i mean really probably crapshoot kind of what is inflation let's go up two to three percent oh this sounds good oh if i do more than that i might upset my customers you know so and we probably were not nearly as methodical that 16 years ago as we are today. <laughs> Availability of data just wasn't there. So that's what I was really right. curious about. Like yeah. how did data, how does data drive your decisions? And I think we need to do that a lot more rather than just feeling or the sense of what we do. And again, you know, we often look to our neighbors or salons in our area to know what their pricing is and what their increases are, kind of follow suit. But it's it's kind of like the bad leading the bad, right? Like they may not have any formula that they're using to to navigate their profitability and raise their prices, and we're following on that. So I think you know I learned my salon management ownership skills from my salon on the salon that I worked for, right? And I and I think it just gets hereditarily press, pushed down, but it really takes. I don't know. I think we're in a great space in the salon industry where we have the access to so much data right now that we can have more informed decisions. Um, so one of the things that, again, I want to stress, and for anybody who's watching this now, um, are the data reviews. You know, really get your team in the first, you know, if, you, if you're new with VISH or if you're currently using VISH, Obviously, one of the most important things is that they use VISH for every service that they do so we can accurately track everything. But the data often takes quite a while for you to understand and for us to understand your business model and working together. So I just like to make sure that everybody, you know, if you haven't had a data review in a while, reach out and have one. Um, and, you know, just how helpful and were the data reviews for you? Um, did you find that there were some things about your business that you thought you knew, but maybe it was different from what it was, or did you gain new insights? How, how were the data reviews for you? Oh, yes. I learned lots of insights as in, I think that everybody think it took, it took eight to 10 ounces to do a toner. <laughs> um, that was one, just the awareness for them. Um, I'm not one for shaming your staff or making them feel bad or whatever it may be, but I did print out like, Hey, this is what you're using. And this is what you're charging. Kind of, I, I would print the reports, um, not to shame them and say your reways are bad and your over usage is bad. It was just more for them to make a realization and for them to see it. That sometimes it's just, I'm just going to mix up where I added too much of this. So I need to add this. And then before you know it, you're wasting a significant amount of color, um, just awareness, awareness for them. We are very data driven within our salon company. They they see their monthly reports, they pull their monthly, their daily numbers and all that. So it's it's very nice for them um, to see that to help them realize what they're actually using and what they should be using. So I, I do think that was really helpful. Um, currently, just this week, me looking at it today and yesterday, I started realizing, I think some of them are not pulling their, um, they're looking in our software versus in VISH for them to be doing their formulas. And so that's something I need to work with them on um, to help them reduce more waste and bring that cost down. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's always, like, you'll get to a point where you sort of plateau and then we can sort of tweak things a little bit and, and even bring down costs and, and waste more. Um, and have you noticed with your team since implementing parts and labor, because now there's an extra charge or more of a charge that's going to the customer, have you noticed them being more conservative? Have you noticed that your purchases monthly are, are not as high? And I know it's early days, but have you, have, do you have any insight there yet? Uh, I, no, our retail to service numbers have stayed the same, maybe if not increased, um, I 
just think being more than being told up front and being more aware that we haven't really had a problem. I don't feel that we've had any um, anybody being more conscious and bringing down our average service tickets about the same, our retail's about the same. So, but in terms of usage, though, do you feel that there's you know the the staff members that maybe are a little bit more cost conscious on passing it off to the customer? Do you feel that they're just using less color or being more mindful when they're mixing? Do you know? I do think they are being more mindful. I don't know necessarily if it's for the consumer or oh my gosh, I don't want my waste to be it. <laughs> 30% and we have my number on blast or whatever. No, <laughs> but yeah, they are definitely more mindful. And I mean, we're, we're stylists. Sometimes we just go and mix up because we don't want to go back and remix again. And I think that they are definitely now that it's being monitored, it's just awareness. It's just definitely, it's just being aware. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Um, okay. So the sort of final, final thought, the final question that I have for you is what advice would you give a salon owner, knowing what you know now, flashback to where you were in 2002 when you opened your salon and the whole journey that you went through, what are some of the better practices that you would um, you would give a salon owner, maybe that's struggling a little bit or wants to have change or maybe to the person who's thinking about opening up their own salon? What, what advice would you give them? I would say spend the money on the front end to set up your systems right set up your um i mean we've had to do remodels and extensions and all that so you want to set up your salon system appropriately don't keep piecemealing it um, and set up your systems as far as how you're charging create a level system look at your demographics kind of do what we did um and the vish those types of systems that are going to help you they may cost money on the front end but in the long run they're definitely going to be worth the while to help you run a profitable salon company. I think that we're, we're in the people industry. We like to make people happy. And so it's hard for salon owners to have those hard conversations with their staff um, and or just the general public. We want to make people feel pretty and give things away. But, you know, we're also in a business. <laughs> so look out for yourself as well. That's great. That's great advice. And, and my brother and I uh, have this company together and <laughs> we would do say we would in the beginning we do everything so we do onboarding we do sales and because of my hairdresser background I would give away the software so often I'd be like oh they feel, I feel you know I really like these people let's give them a discount or let's give them free this or free that it's like we we're trying to run a business stop giving things away for free so it's definitely in our nature to do that um and I think having a coach really is one of those things because I don't know I know that when we when we start and we onboard a salon and I know that they have a coach I know the onboarding experience is going to be much easier for us in terms of the structure that's already in place and implementing change how do you feel about that how do you feel having a coach uh, has changed the way you look at your business and you approach your business are you talking my summit coach or talking having you y'all come and coach summit oh, oh absolutely um it, it was hard I mean it was eye-opening and it was hard I think I cried for a good six months when doing it um but it is totally um worth every bit of penny and as as salon owners who do you have to hold you accountable I mean I've got my sister she's my business partner we do two totally different things um, and so it's nice to have somebody, you know, if I give a staff member or manager a deadline, she's going to meet it because I'm holding her accountable. Who's holding me accountable? So, um, and like you said, you know, way back in the day, I would just call around and say, hey, how much do you charge for a haircut? How much do you do this? Like, where are you getting your knowledge from? You know, maybe the internet, but now you have someone who is very versed in this industry and it's not just, let me just pull something out of the air and make it a policy. Let's, let's actually make sense of this and be without a go behind it. So having yeah. a coach. And do, you, do you see like these bumps in growth when you've implemented these things? So when you've gone from, you know, when you started your salon to your summit coach and now to Vish, like are these noted has noticeable impact uh, in your business? Are these oh, things yeah. giving you growth? So where did you start? Where, where I said that was my last question, but it's never my last question. <laughs> uh, 
Where did you start? How many staff did you have when you started? And I, I heard you say you have 50 staff now. We had seven booth rental staff members, and then we turned commission. Um, I think, like I said, we were doing $17,000 maybe. I was doing the most of it. Um, we're on track for, I think, three and a half, four million this year. So um, yeah, it's a lot. But we, and, and like you said, it was just you and your brother. You're doing the sales and you're doing the onboarding and you're doing this. And that's kind of how it was. I was doing all of the front of the house. I'm doing clients. I'm working a 32 plus hour work week with clients and I'm doing the staff and doing all that. And now we've grown to where we've got managers and things like that. So I get to do more of the things that I like to do. So. And is that being with people being with staff? What, what, what is your, the last, I promise, the last <laughs> is uh what does your day-to-day -day look like now day-to-day -day, uh so i do a lot of our marketing kind of pre-planning out our marketing and what we're going to do um a little bit of social media working with our social media team um business but my favorite part is just to walk around and talk to all of our clients and you know kind of be the face of the company a lot of our clients i mean they were my clients 20 years ago so um i just i get to go out and hang out with them and talk to the staff and hang out with them and it's part of the business and it's my favorite part. So, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. This is really great. I enjoy this um, and, I, and I learned something and I'm, you know, my wheels are going to spin and so many great things will come from these conversations. Uh, I really appreciate your business and, you know, just giving back to us. And, um, you know, I've already asked you to do a bunch of other things. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Bring it yeah. on. We like it. <laughs> Y'all are helping us. So, hey, what can I do? <laughs> I appreciate it. And we appreciate your knowledge and your success. And uh, I look forward to having more of these with you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a good day.